This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Since my last review of harmonic mounts almost a year ago now, we've seen many more models of these kinds of mounts enter the scene. Harmonic mounts use a kind of technology called strain wave gearing that allows for the mount itself to be very compact and lightweight, but hold a lot of weight as payload, even without counterweights. Now, in some cases, you'll still wanna use a counterweight on a counterweight shaft so that your whole rig doesn't topple over. That would be a disaster, but we'll get into all of that. In this video, I'm gonna be reviewing two of these new harmonic mounts that I was personally most interested in, the ZWO AM3 right here and the Pegasus NYX 101. And then I'll be comparing them to a mount I've already reviewed, the ZWO AM5. And you might be wondering why compare three different mounts with different payload limits? Well, I think it's interesting to see how much we can push different mounts. Um, and I think people might be looking at this AM3 as a downgrade option from the AM5 and looking at the NYX 101 as an upgrade option from the AM5. So I think this is an interesting trio to compare in that respect. I also included the AM5 um, in my last comparison review. So it's a nice through line between the two reviews if you wanna watch both and sort of make a mega comparison. And since I own the AM5, I'll keep including it in any future harmonic mount shootouts so you can see uh, it as a reference model to compare everything else to. Since this is a review, a couple quick disclosures up front here. At my request, uh, ZWO sent me the AM3. Pegasus Astro sent me this NYX 101. No money exchanged hands, and they don't have any say in what I share in this video. I do want to thank ZWO and Pegasus Astro, though, for sending out these review units, um, as these kinds of equipment loans are the only way I can do these comparisons on my channel, because I can't afford to buy all of these different expensive things personally. So let's jump into the comparison now, starting with design and features. All three of these can be used in either equatorial or alt as mode. I have them right now in equatorial mode and for deep sky astrophotography like I do, you would really only use equatorial mode. Uh, and with equatorial mode, you have to polar align them. Um, but the benefit uh, is that you can take long exposures without field rotation because you're, you're rotating around the pole uh, just like the stars do. The benefit of the alt as mode is uh, it puts the telescope in a better position if you're a visual observer and, and you're looking through an eyepiece. So if you're looking for mounts that can do both modes, alt as and equatorial, all three of these fit the bill. They're also similar in that they don't include polar alignment scopes. Uh, so they rely on the user to know how to polar align with a more modern means, probably like a software solution in combination uh, with a guide scope you can, and a guide camera, you can do good polar alignment routines uh, using various software, SharpCap Pro, Nina, ASI Air. In my case, I use a QHY Polemaster, which is a, the small polar alignment camera that comes with dedicated software. And as you can see here, it can be adapted to an attached underslung adapter uh, made by ADM that puts it right on the dovetail plate, and that works very well. When you will pull our line using a camera instead of your eye, the camera has to know the axis of rotation for the mount. So with all these kinds of uh, software routines, it's going to ask you to move the mount in right ascension. I did like the way that uh, the Pegasus Unity software, there was a module down here for moving the mount in exact degrees in RA. Uh, maybe it was designed just for this purpose. So that made it very easy to do what the Pole Master software was asking me to do, move it in RA by 30 degrees. The ZWO driver works fine for this purpose too. It's just the more old school clicking and holding on the virtual keypad here uh, to get it to move. As I think I said in the last review, these mounts are definitely techie. If you're someone who would want to have a mount that doesn't need any kind of computer or mobile app to run, then these mounts aren't for you um, because they have no way to do traditional polar alignment. Uh, right now, they don't have traditional hand controllers, it might be coming soon with the Pegasus. And they assume that you're gonna be using sort of software uh, to control them. They're really um, great for imagers. In terms of the ease of polar alignment with the included equatorial wedge on each mount, uh, I found the NYX 101's altitude adjustment knob the best design of these three. It was very smooth and easy no matter how much weight I put on the mount. The best azimuth adjustment probably goes to the AM5. 
Um, but the NYX 101 was decent too. I just found that the knobs were a little bit harder to grasp. It's not even really the size, but how closely these little nibs are together that made it harder. Of course, on bigger mount, like the EQ6R has these bigger knobs and bolts, and that makes them much easier to grip and turn. I know I'm not comparing the EQ6R, but just as an, as an example, um, I do like that. The AM3 uh, had the most uh, difficult adjustment control of the three tested here. It, it didn't look much different from the AM5, but I found any small movement here resulted in a very coarse adjustment, uh, meaning that you had to spend a lot more time going, going back and forth because when adjusting it, it was very easy to overshoot and then you'd have to come back and overshoot again and it just takes a lot longer. In terms of connections, on the AM3 and AM5, they're mostly on the front here. The only real difference is that on the AM3, it comes with a Bluetooth wireless connection in addition to the Wi-Fi that both the AM5 and AM3 have, but it lacks a 12 volt power out that the AM5 has here on the side. They both use a normal 12 volt 2.1 millimeter center pin connector for power input and USB-B to connect to a computer for a wired connection. And they have ST4 guiding if you wanted to use that for some reason. I'm not sure why modern mounts are all still putting ST4 on uh, as pulse guiding is much better, but I'm sure there's some cases where ST4 is demanded. The NYX 101 has uh, an ST4 II. Uh, in the manual, that indicate that this could also be used for an optional hand controller that's still in development. The NYX 101 also uses USB-B for a wired data connection. And other than that, it uses different kinds of ports than the ZWO mounts. As you can see on the back here, all the ports are on the back. For 12 volt power in and out, Pegasus has chosen the threaded GX12 connector, the same one that Skywatcher uses for power in on the EQ6R. Personally, I really like this connector. Um, it's very robust and there's no chance that it's gonna fall out since it's threaded, unlike a typical uh, 12 volt barrel connector. The NYX 101 comes with an AC adapter that already has the GX12 connector on it. But uh, let me go into a little bit of an aside here about the AC adapter. Uh, the provided one with the mount is a max five amp unit. Uh, so that's only meant to power the mount. I somehow missed that part of the manual, even though it was very clearly spelled out. And what I was trying to do was I was trying to use this five amp power supply unit to power everything, the mount, my camera cooler, my dew heater band, etc. And then I was having connection issues with the mount where it would just not connect to my laptop. Very frustrating. And the reason being is my camera cooler and my dew band and all these other things were hogging the power and the mount wasn't getting enough uh, power to form the data connection. So completely my fault. Um, I emailed the Pegasus folks and they figured out what was going on very quickly. And uh, what I should have been using for the configuration that I was doing where like every, all the power was routed through the mount was an optional 10 amp power supply uh, that Pegasus uh, makes for this. So again, the five amp one that comes with the mount is for powering the mount only. If you're going to route power through the mount uh, to everything else, then you'll need the 10 amp power supply uh, unit. Okay, in terms of other connections, the NYX 101 also has Wi-Fi on board. It can either create its own Wi-Fi network you can connect to to control it, or it can be configured to use your home network, which is really nice because then your computer would still be able to connect to the internet while you're controlling the NYX 101. Uh, next, let's look at the saddles. All three mounts have dual saddles, meaning that they can take either Vixen, the skinnier, or Lasmandi, the wider style dovetail plates. These are the two standards for telescopes worldwide. The NYX 101 usually comes with a normal saddle, but it's also available now in a package with the saddle power box, which is how I have it configured here. And with the saddle power box, you can route the power up from the power out on the mount, and then you'll have uh, all of your other connections, you know, power, dew heaters, USB, up on here with the telescope. And I love this, this makes cable management a lot easier as I talked about in my last video. For me, this is this saddle power box edition is something that makes the NYX 101 really stand out. Of course, uh, the saddle power box can be bought separately and adapted to the AM5 or the EQ6R, but it's only gonna match the mount like this in the black and blue color scheme with the NYX 101, if that kind of thing is important to you. 
I know some people are interested in how much sound these mounts make, uh, both when slewing and just when tracking. So let's do some tests here. You might want to turn up your volume, but I'll warn you when to turn it back down. Okay, the next thing is weight and payload, and this is where harmonic drive mounts are so very interesting. The ZWO AM3 mount head is definitely the smallest, lightest of the bunch. It's 8.6 pounds, and it has a payload limit of 17.6 pounds without counterweights or 28.6 pounds with a counterweight. The ratio of max payload to mount head weight is 3.3 to 1. The ZWO AM5 mount head weighs 12.1 pounds. The max payload without counterweights is 28.6 pounds. And the max payload with a counterweight is 44 pounds. So the ratio of max payload to mount weight for the AM5 is 3.6 to 1. And the Pegasus NYX 101 mount head weighs 14.3 pounds. The max payload without counterweights is 44 pounds. And with a counterweight, it's 66 pounds. The ratio of max payload to mount weight is a very good 4.6 to 1. Uh, so next, let's look at base price for each and what's included at that base price. The base price in US dollars at time of recording for just the mount heads was $1,500 for the AM3, $2,000 for the AM5, and $2,960 for the NYX 101. And in terms of optional accessories, you're going to add about four to five hundred dollars in either any of the cases to get them into the configurations like this, where it's a carbon fiber tripod with a pier extension. If you're just adding the carbon fiber tripod, that's going to be just three to three fifty. At the base price, you get the mount head, a USB cable, a nice carrying case for each mount. And uh, although the cases for the AM5 and the NYX 101, they have more of a premium feel with this cloth exterior and a metal zipper, while the AM3 case is a little bit cheaper looking, it's just foam with some latches at the top. And the NYX 101 comes with that 5 amp power supply, which I talked about earlier. The ZWO mounts do not come with any power supplies or cables, so it's something you're going to have to pick up uh, yourself to get these working. Any of the mounts can be adapted to Skywatcher tripods with the right optional pieces, which is very nice if you were going to put a big payload on this. I, I tested them exclusively on the carbon fiber tripods because I was interested in how they would do in that kind of configuration. Um, but I don't actually recommend that if you're putting a really big telescope on them. I first tried the three mounts with this setup. This is my no counterweight setup. It's just under the limit for the AM3 without a counterweight. It weighs 15.5 pounds or seven kilograms. The focal length on this scope, the Ascar 103 Apo is, uh, with a 1X flattener is 700 millimeters. And the camera is the ASI 2600 MC Duo. And that makes the image scale 1.1 arc seconds per pixel. I wanted to use the same polar alignment with all three mounts. So I use the QHY Pole Master attached to the end of the dovetail like this with the ADM saddle. And there was no need for a guide scope since the Duo took care of that with its integrated guide camera. We're going to look at both graphs uh, of my guiding performance and images. Okay, now we're going to look at the guide graphs. This is Andy Galasso's PhD2 log viewer. It's cross-platform just like PhD2. And you basically just find your guide log and load it up here. And uh, it does a really cool job of analyzing uh, your guiding performance. Now, before I jump into my analysis and the numbers, um, let me say a few things up front here. One is that I did use multi-star guiding. I did calibrate for each new setup, of course. 
I did not use PPEC. Uh, a lot of people know about that. Uh, it's, it's a way that it can sort of analyze your guiding performance and improve uh, as it goes. It's, a, it's like an algorithm you can turn on within uh, PhD2. Uh, part of the reason I didn't use it is because with my previous mount test, I didn't know about that. And so I was using the normal algorithms. Uh, and so I'd, I wanted to make this sort of fair with the previous comparisons. Um, but then I also think that the defaults are probably what most people are going to be using. Um, so it's, it's basically just the defaults, but I do turn on multi-star guiding and of course calibrate with a, an appropriate area of the sky. All right, enough caveats here. So this is my first, uh, imaging session of the night. This is the ZWO AM5. Uh, it was early in the night, uh, probably just right after it got to astronomical darkness. And again, this is with the Ascar 103 APO 700 millimeter focal length. Okay. So this is about 40 minutes of data, and you can see the scale here is four, four arc seconds plus minus, so eight arc seconds uh, from the bottom to the top here. And you can see that most of the time it was staying within a one arc second um, deviation. There was really just this one sub where it was having um, some spikes that uh, almost reach, you know, two arc seconds, uh, but it recovered quickly from them. I don't know what was going on here. There was a bunch of spikes in a row in declination. In any case, the total RMS here was 0 0.47 arc seconds. So uh, very good in terms of those, you know, total numbers. I do think that people... Uh, <laughs> think a little bit too strongly of this, uh, you know, total RMS number. I understand that it's like a single number that we can sort of judge things by, uh, but it doesn't tell the whole story as we'll see as we go here uh, and get into the images as well and all of that. So, um, but anyways, for people that are interested, it was 0 0.47 total RMS. And that's what the guide graph looked like, pretty good. Here is the NYX 101 with that same telescope, the uh, ASCAR 103 APO. Um, and again, uh, keeping mostly within, you know, one arc second deviation. There's a couple subs in here where it, there was sort of no spikes, or three in a row here where there's no spikes above one arc second in either direction. Uh, but then there's a few excursions uh, here. Um, uh, the total RMS for the NYX 101 was 0 0.57 arc seconds. And this is again with no counterweights. Here's the ZWO AM3. And you can see compared to the first two, it's a little spikier. Like uh, there's more just sort of spikes in general across the whole thing. It actually started out pretty smoothly and then it, and then for the last like, I don't know, eight subs here, it, it got spikier. Um, but it recovered quickly from all of those spikes and for the most part, I, I mean, I think for a $1,500 mount, uh, I think that's pretty, pretty incredible um, that it's mostly staying within that, uh, that one arc second range back and forth. And overall, it looks pretty smooth. It does the spikes, you know, if it can recover quickly from them, it shouldn't cause any kind of irregularity in the stars. Total RMS here, 0 0.64 arc seconds total RMS. All right, so now let's uh, head over to PixInsight and take a look at the images. So I will just open these up uh, just to show you yeah, when you're zoomed out like this and you just look at them, they of course <laughs> look identical, which is sort of what you would expect, right? Like uh, with guiding performance that close and uh, something that's not super demanding for these mounts, you know, 700 millimeter focal length, uh, we're getting very similar uh, results here. I will show these uh, full screen as well for people that uh, like to see that. I've had requests for that. So here's the NYX 101, here's the AM5, and here's the AM3. 
Okay, now let's look at some close-ups and see if we can see any differences. And when, if it, with my eagle eye, I think that I can actually see that the AM5 is uh, the sharpest by just a hair over the NYX 101 and that the AM3 is noticeably uh a little bit fuzzier than both. This sort of surprises me that, you know, when you're just talking about uh, very small differences in, in guiding performance that you can actually see uh, the sharpness differences in these little stars. But I guess, you know, the AM3 did have quite a bit more spikes in that guide graph. So I can sort of see how that would result in uh, these slightly blurrier stars but you really have to be sort of uh, pixel peeping, I think, to see uh, something like this. But if, if critical you know, sharpness is, is super important to you, then uh, the NYX 101 and AM5 did, did slightly better than the AM3 here. Now, I, if I had all the time in the world, I would have loved to have done like a, an even shorter focal length instrument to see if we could see any differences there, but you can sort of extrapolate and, and think, okay, if the differences are this small at 700 millimeters, at 300 millimeters, we might see no difference uh, whatsoever. On my second test with all these mounts, I used a bigger telescope and a counterweight. This payload weighs 29 pounds or 13.1 kilograms. So right over the edge of what the AM3 um, is purported to handle with, with a counterweight. Even though the NYX 101 um, can technically handle uh, up to 44 pounds without a counterweight, I don't think it's a good idea on the carbon fiber tripod. So I did use one here. And this is the Ascar 130PHQ with 1000 millimeter focal length. And again, the ASI 2600 MC Duo. This puts the image scale at a demanding 0.78 arc seconds per pixel. I again polar lined with Polemaster uh, attached to the dovetail. I did this all on the same night. Uh, so I started at 6 p.m. and went to almost 2 a.m. Um, there were some downsides to that, of course. Here is the AM3 with the now the Ascar 130 PHQ and a counterweight. And I I want to make clear here, I don't necessarily recommend pushing the AM3 to this limit like this. This is I was actually half a pound over its uh, maximum uh, payload capacity with, uh, with the 130 PHQ and a camera and no no guide scope, nothing else. Uh, so it, it was really sort of pushing the limit of the AM3. And the Iris Nebula, which I was shooting, was just to the left of Polaris, right? Like it was, it was, it was almost, you know, in home position, basically. So the, the bulk of the weight was sort of balanced right over the mount. If, if I'd been shooting something else, like that, where the uh, telescope when it was in a more like uh, wonky position off to the side, I would have been a little bit worried with just that little tripod and little mount, um, you know, because that's a heavy scope, uh, 30 pounds. So be careful if you do something like this. It's not something I would necessarily recommend, but for testing, I just wanted to show uh, what the AM3 could do. And in terms of uh, number here, it's it recorded 0 0.81 arc second RMS. Um, there are a few uh, little spikes here over four arc seconds, um, and then also a few over three. Um, but but actually, you know, it, it looks pretty good. Um, now, when we look at the images, it's going to be sort of a different story, and I don't I don't quite know how to explain how good this guide graph is uh, compared to the image, but that's giving a little bit of a spoiler. Okay, so here's the AM5, and um, looks pretty similar in some respects to the AM3, I think. You know, just the the spikes are in different places, but it's sort of the same story. And then the total number is also the same, 0.8 RMS, um, 0.8 arc seconds RMS, sorry. Uh, so uh, that looks pretty good too. 
Um, I have tested the 130PHQ on the AM5 before and been happy with the results. So uh, this is sort of in line with uh, what I expected out of the AM5. And then uh, here's the Nix 101. And I will say that by 1.30 a.m. or 1.20 a.m. when I was doing this, um, unfortunately, the iris was quite a bit lower in the sky than it had been, you know, an hour earlier. Uh, so you can see sort of towards the end of the AM5 here, it's getting a little bit worse. Um, and I think that part of the reason the... Um, the total number here on the Nix 101 is a little bit higher at 0.98 arc second total RMS is because the uh, object was lower in the sky. So you're shooting through more atmosphere and the atmosphere is more turbulent, uh, you know, lower towards the horizon than it would be when the object is higher in the sky. But in any case, um, just like the other two, most of it seems to be within around one and a half uh, arc second up and down. And then there's some spikes uh, in the three to four arc second range. But now let's look at the images because they sort of tell a different story, which I think is interesting. Um, so again, in according to this, the AM3 and the AM5 uh, have the you know, the best performance here and the Nix 101 was a little bit worse. Here are now the images. And again, when you just sort of look at them like this, zoomed out, you're not gonna see much. I will make them full screen here for people that like to see that. So here's the Nix 101, here's the AM5. And here's the AM3. Now, here is what I thought was one of the most interesting uh, results. Just like before, the, I feel like the AM3 has the worst image of the three, but it's a, it's different than that that first case. So if we remember the first case, it was just because the stars are a little bit blurrier um, with the AM3 than they are with the other two. Now, it's the stars aren't as round, right? Like they, they have this little um, divot off to the right uh, that's sort of giving them a little bit of a triangular shape. And I've had this before with this scope and I wasn't sure if it was mount problems or a scope problem. So it's just interesting to me that on the same night, three different mounts, same telescope, same camera, I'm getting much rounder stars with these two and this one is giving me these sort of triangular stars again. Um, so I don't know exactly what the answer is here, but it's just sort of interesting that the AM3 uh, has this little divot off to, off to the right here that you can see most clearly on the bigger stars. But if I zoom in here, you can see it's sort of on all of them. But it's really clear on this... Uh, on this big star right here. And when I looked at the individual subs, they were all sort of messed up like this. Uh, so it wasn't just some just the combination of the stack. It was like they were all sort of weird like this. Um, well, over here, the data looked pretty good. And then, oh, and then the other thing I find interesting is that um, even though it said that uh, the AM5 was 0 0.8 arc seconds. This one was 0 0.98. To my eye, the stars are just a little bit rounder in the Nix 101 uh, versus the AM5. But the, these two are so close that I don't, I don't know. It's, it's hard to really pick a winner there. And again, when you just zoom out a little bit, uh, this isn't even zoomed out all the way. Uh, a lot of these differences aren't as apparent. Some of you are probably going to take away that, oh, well, I can get the 130 PHQ and put it on the AM3. That, again, that's not really what I'm recommending here. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to test it to its limit. But if, if you're going to use a, a big telescope regularly, um, you're probably going to be looking at something like the Nix 101 because it's going to be more reliable and stable over the long term. 
Um, and then the other thing, you know, I use the carbon fiber tripod on all of these because that's what uh, was supplied and it's a lot, a lot of people will probably go for that. But it, with a big telescope, you'd probably also want to upgrade your tripod, use some kind of steel or aluminum tripod, uh, something with thicker uh, legs and more weight to it uh, is going to help too. In the end, I think the uh, the images and looking at the actual stars really tells the story of these mounts. I, I really just, I don't like to put my finger on the scale. I just like to uh, sort of show you the data and my testing results as honestly as I as I can and, and as fully as I can. And then hopefully it'll help you make a decision about uh, which mount is correct for you. And I know this was a video about uh, testing mounts, but I did collect a lot of images in testing these mounts. So if you'll indulge me here just for a minute, I put together all my testing data to make a couple images from that one uh, night. So this is the wider shot. Uh, this is using uh, about a little under three hours of data at 700 millimeters. And uh, I was just trying to bring out the brown dust around the iris and also uh, the, I like the colorful star field. Of course, it's a little bit noisy, so uh, excuse the uh, background being not uh, silky black, but I think it's still pretty interesting. And then this one, actually, I found even more fun to process. I kept it intentionally dark and sort of uh, the stars minimal because I really wanted to draw the eye to the core of the iris because there's some really cool structure in there that I feel like a lot of people, because they are bringing out the dust around the iris, the core of the iris gets sort of blown out and you don't really see all this fine detail. But look at how interesting these little wisps and structures are. I'm typically a wide field guy. I mean, you know, under a thousand millimeters, but this is actually making me have a little bit of aperture fever and wanting to, to go up over, over a thousand, which is sort of my limit right now, because there's some cool detail in here that I didn't see quite like this in wider shots. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. If you're like me, the mounts I just reviewed are really fun to play with, but at the end of the day, I use them as tools to make astrophotos that I can be proud of and wanna show off. And I use Squarespace for my personal portfolio at nicocarver.com because Squarespace makes it super easy with their website builder and professional templates. It's really nice because you can customize your site however you wish quite easily with their drag and drop engine. And of course, Squarespace sites also look great on mobile devices through responsive design. I've also found Squarespace takes the hassle out of managing a website. No more fiddling with CSS for hours just to get something to look right. There's a huge amount of included features with Squarespace, like if you need an online store, that's built right in. So if you're looking for any kind of website, whether it's a portfolio of your photographs or a site for your small business, I think you're gonna love Squarespace. You can get a free trial today at squarespace.com and when you're ready to launch, use squarespace.com slash nebulaphotos for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. This has been Nico Carver at Nebula Photos. Clear skies, everyone.